I'm in Hong Kong with my friend Damien from Kung Fit, and we're here to explore the local martial arts. While the predominant culture of Hong Kong is Cantonese, northern martial arts are also well represented here. In the early 20th century, many prominent northern style masters migrated to the more affluent south of China. A big driving force for this was the Jingwu Athletic Association, whose core mission was to popularize martial arts practice as a means of physical exercise and reinforcing a sense of Chinese identity in the newly founded republic. Before we get into that, I wanted to see if I could find the Wing Chun teacher I trained with back in 2007, when I was just 18 years old, Kwa Kwan Ping. Master Kwok taught me a less common style of Wing Chun, which came from Yun Kei San and not Yip Man. I hadn't managed to get in contact with him, but I had been told that he still teaches at Kowloon Park in the mornings. We thought we would try our luck and see if we could find him. What do you think your chances are, Will? I don't know. People have told me he still teaches in the park, but this is a pretty big park. I haven't seen him for, got a, what, 15 years? 2008 was the last time I trained with him. And, uh, so I'm not sure if I'd even recognize him now. I mean, he must be. He must be like coming up to 90 years old, um, so we'll see. I reckon if he's going to be anywhere, the Kung Fu corner spot is a pretty good bet. Some of you might remember one of the first videos I ever put on YouTube years ago, back in 2007, was me training Wing Chun here in Hong Kong at 18 years old with a master Kwok Kwan Ping. We thought we'd try our luck, come along, see if we can find him and uh, ask him if he is willing to do an interview for the channel. So well, what do you reckon? We failed so far. Single. We haven't found Master Quark. I mean, he must be pushing 90, so I honestly don't know if he's still actively teaching. I've just been told this was a spot Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Uh, but um, it's worth a try, at least. So Damien, when was the last time you were actually in Hong Kong? 2017, so uh, what's that, six years ago, about this time of year. Um, It'll be interesting to see how much has changed since then. Obviously, a lot has happened within uh, the social and political climate since then. And you were there like right after the protests, right? Or uh, during them? After some. Um, it was a year after the uh, kind of transition to China taking control of, of Hong Kong. It was before the really, really big ones. Um, but yeah, things were quite kind of quiet about it, everyone was like, oh yeah, it's great, we love it. And I think that's cool. So it was kind of still quite tense. Yeah. So you, can't really, you can't really feel anything now, I don't think, at least, you know, not the first yeah. impressions. But, I mean, I've not been here since. I used to come all the time, so like from between 2007, 2009, when I was living in, first moved to China, and I was always on 90 day tourist visas, so I was constantly coming to Hong Kong to do a visa run. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, that was before all of that, so. Um, yeah, it was quite quite different. That being said, I still think it's there's a lot of like Hong Kong still got a lot of its own character. Like I was expecting from the way people have talked about it, I was expecting sort of you know to hear much more Mandarin being spoken, things feeling much more like mainland China. Mm, yeah. like when I was in Macau earlier this year, like Macau, other than the whole Portuguese influence, it does feel quite similar to mainland China. Whereas Hong Kong still has, like, I guess a sense of uniqueness. Yeah. It still has a lot of its own character. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, actually, last time I was here uh, was during uh, China Day, and you had 
hundreds and thousands of mainlanders going down to Hong Kong to do oh, shopping. Yeah, yeah. And there's certainly a sense of frustration <laughs> <laughs> around that. There's lots of people sort of descending into your shops. Um, and I suppose like security and everything would have been pretty tight when it'd be a national day. Yes, yeah, yeah. So in some ways it's, it definitely does feel a lot more chill now, it's, it's quieter. Yeah. Um, yeah, security isn't as tight as we see. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't think it feels too different. There's new buildings, some like spruced up areas like you get anywhere in that, in that time period. Um, but it's still early days. Yeah, so we shall see. Indeed. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the series so far. There's still lots of great content still to come, so make sure you are subscribed, and that way you won't miss out on any of the future episodes. Plus, once all of this is over, there's going to be more content from our trip to Hong Kong over on my channel, Kung Fit. So if you're interested in seeing that, or content that will help make you a better martial artist and fit for life, make sure you subscribe to Kung Fit as well. For now, let's get on with the show. We wanted to also take a look at some northern styles and so were invited to the Mizong Luohan School of Master Douglas Lau at the South China Athletic Association. Master Lau's father, Lau Tong Yim, came from Shandong province and migrated to Hong Kong in the early 20th century. He learnt the art of Mizong Luohan from Yip Yue Ting, a native of Tangzhou County in Hebei province who was affiliated with the Jingwu Association. Could you maybe just introduce uh, what is Mizong Luohan Chen? Yeah. Uh... The Mijong Lohan, after the Second World War, is my grandmaster coming to Hong Kong. And when they come to Hong Kong, they got nothing to do, just try to find a job. But it's lucky, come to South China here, he just only for security. Because he saw the master, saw the chief said, I only learned the, the Mijong Kung Fu. So the officer here promised him to stay here and then to, for, for the bodyguard. He joined many competitions, he got the champion. So the chief officer here, they know that Mr. Yip, your Xiong Kung was very well. So can you try to teach, have a, a class to teach the adult, teach the boy here? So at that moment, Mr. Yip, my grandmaster, they start to teach the Xiong Kung Jong. So at that moment, my father is very lucky. From a friend, he introduced him to learn the Kung Fu here. So my father teach him, my Mr. Yip, nearly 40 years for helping the Seolun Kung Fu. And also my father, he learned Mantis, Pekwa, Seolun, Tai Chi. So at that moment, I'm only about six or uh, seven. So I follow him, have many performances. So even the chief, the officer here said, hey, your son, I wonder, he can learn so many Kung Fu. So try to call him here for, for helping. 1973, I'm about 19. So here, over 20, over 200 students to learn from the Bijou Kung Fu. Because at that moment we say the Kung Fu heat here. So many foreigner, Japanese, even Chinese, many people learn. So when my father getting older, I'm taking charge here, nearly 40 years. Last few months, we bring five students to have a performance in China, Han. And also 2,300 people, we got this silver. So this year I'm 76. Uh, the last moment I can talk to tell, that, tell everybody, Kung Fu, you need to learn. You need to practice every day. Whatever Mi Zhong, Wing Chun, Chao for Tai Chi is the same. We say my father's moment, Every day, practice eight hours. Eight hours. Not only one month, three months, for the whole life. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. 
They seem to have quite a lot of uh, weapon sets. Would you say that weapons forms are kind of more the focus of the style than like yeah, hand forms? I so. Here, I would say so, and different uh, practitioners of our style, so different people you see tonight, we specialise in different things. Mm. We're someone who specialises in uh, the spear, we're someone who specialises in the sabre, we're someone who practices uh, you know, the, the hard body kung fu, the law on Yeah. We also have someone who does the, who does the like kung fu. Uh, personally, I uh, am not very good with uh, fair handed forms, uh, the fair handed techniques, so I do weapons. I'm better, at, uh, Fair enough. I'm better at, at, at these things. This weapon comes from the Chinese Republic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You see, another country have many strong person, horse. But another country get no horse, just have this like this saber. So how to attack the enemy? We use this saber to cut off the horse thumb and cut off the horse's neck, the leg. So this is very famous. And this is modeled after uh, a bamboo weapon that was brought uh, from the north by that opening uh, grandmaster. It's, it's called the Zamabu, the horse fashion saber. And uh, the shape of this weapon is not a conventional Zamabu, but is unique to a uh, house school like the So just now, you saw this one here. So uh, this is how it looks like. But when it is actually applied, you have to move it. So this is how it looks like when you use it in combat. There's a motion that's charging forward on it. That's a nice collection of gems. So these swords are, uh, they used to belong to a uh, lineage opening grandmaster Yi Butei. So he brought it to Hong Kong from uh, the north of China, uh, in the Hebei province, and he used them when he was, uh, he used them when he was a member of the armed escort, and they're rumored to be cursed. So those who have used uh, this sword to practice, they, uh, they've been afflicted by all sorts of strange illnesses, and therefore you know, we keep it here and we try to be, uh, we try not to have anyone touch them. Okay, I'm very afraid of going anywhere near that. I'm, I'm not even going to go any closer than I am now. <laughs> My friend Jimmy Pong was also at the school, and while his own teacher was overseas, he was more than happy to show us some of his Seven Star Mantis. Seven Star Mantis was brought to Hong Kong by Luo Gongyu, who came from Peng Lai in Shandong province, and was invited to teach the art at the Jinghua Athletic Association, first in Shanghai, later in Foshan, and then Hong Kong. If you're practicing Seven Star Mantis in the West, chances are it came from him. So this is the most basic one. And then we increase the straightest of Yeah, mm. So after that, we'll move on to uh, 
的空手，来，泰根斯，曹曹华山。哦，黑虎头线，呀呀呀 ，OK When you do the when you do these basic drills, do you have like follow up techniques? So usually we do this as a set. Hmm. And then kick. Yeah. And the other person will follow. Hmm. And then you do the set. Okay. Yeah. A lot of our moves start with the oh, this is like one of the cornerstone. Yeah. And then after that we had the bump chop. Hmm. Yeah. So is that what you mean by follow up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about the twelve key words, right? Yeah. Golo Thai. Yeah. Well, actually, in Thai Jumanzis they're different, but for seven star, yeah. It's Golo Thai Diao Gua. Eight hundred and twelve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we have similar. Mm. Yeah. As northern style practitioners, Damien and I enjoyed seeing some familiar movements to our own. Although for the next part of the trip, we'll move into new territory for the both of us, the arts of the Hakka people. Luckily, our friend Linda Ung from Sydney will be joining us, a teacher of dragon style, and will help us navigate this new world.